panel here. Welcome to SPX Programming, first day programming. I'm very proud um, to have been asked to moderate the barometer of the free press panel with a distinguished panel, a distinguished uh, a group of editorial cartoonists and uh, cartoonists that work in a political vein. And actually, uh, starting down at the end, at the end we have Matt Worker, who is a longtime political cartoonist at Politico. And uh, you know, we kind of forget now with with Matt kind of how radical a um, move that was and, and a, a kind of a place for you to relocate. He's one of our Pulitzer Prize winners on the board. And Politico is not only, I think it's really useful to have Matt here, not just for his individual experience, but Politico's experience of kind of working multiple formats and trying to find what works. So we always think of Politico kind of where we enter it, but you guys have had a long history of trying to find solutions to various editorial cartooning problems and and uh, we're kind of in a problem phase right now. Um, <laughs> so, so that's Matt. Next to uh, Matt is Ann Telmas, our other Pulitzer Prize winner on the, on the panel. And current Rubin um, Award winner. One of the few to do that is an amazing thing. Congratulations, Ann, on that great. And you were either about to be or are right now the president of the AAEC, and I don't remember which one. I am right now. You are right now. Counting the days. So I know it's, it's, it's great to have Anne here because Anne has a real interest in getting more young people, which SPX provides in droves, to do or to investigate editorial cartooning and politically interested cartooning as part of their overall repertoire. And so more I, women, too. Yes. So I hope that you younger cartoonists will welcome her to your tables and seek her out and see what the kind of support the AAEC can provide. Um, ben Passmore is um, right next to Anne. Ben is a cartoonist that kind of came to a lot of our um, uh, attention through his comic, his Ignatz nominated comic, Your Black Friend. But he's also done some really interesting politically um, fueled comics for the NIP, um, two of which we'll talk about here today. And then one of the great, one of the great general citizens of comics, Keith Knight, who does comics all over the place in all various forms and varieties, including straight up political cartooning and kind of politically interested cartooning from his own perspective. So please help me welcome all of them. And I, you know, I have a few questions, and we're going to bounce around some of the images provided. But really, uh, you know, an SBX panel is about all of you that have come out here. So, at some point, pretty early on, for a panel like this, we are going to open up questions on the sides um, for everyone to ask your questions. I figure if you take time away from the magnificent display up there on the floor to come down here and listen to a panel, then you uh, get to ask any question you want, any and every. You don't have to answer them, but you get to ask them. <laughs> So you were here today because, Anne, you gave a speech. Yeah. And the specific, um, this was the end of that speech. OK, I have to remember how to do this now. I do, no, I don't do that. I do, yeah. OK, so I have jelly fingers. So I'm looking for that next. You're going number two? Uh, yes. That was number three, so I can just go back to number two. Okay. I got you, I think. Well, this is going to be an adventure, excuse me. But this is how you ended your speech, um, which was uh, about kind of the, the state of, of editorial cartooning under attack. Editorial cartoon is a barometer for all of our free speech rights. A silence cartoonist is an indicator of an unhealthy environment for freedom of expression in any given society. If we want to protect free speech in the free press, we must vigorously protect the editorial cartoonist. And this speech, which I urge all of you to read at some point, which is searchable with Anne's name in Ottawa, or Ottawa's free speech, um, you give a, a remarkable amount of context for this, in context in terms of American history, where editorial cartoonists have been pursued and kind of harassed by those in power. And the, in also situations in Turkey um, and in Iran, um, where these ha have happened editorial cartoonists. But I wondered if you could personalize it. Like, what is it? that you were experiencing in this kind of bizarre period since last November's election that really gravely concerns you personally? What kind of pushed you over to the idea that, that this, is, this is an assault, this is a, a danger point, and that we have to be on guard? Um, everybody can hear me, yeah? OK. Um, I, I travel occasionally and, and attend international cartooning events. 
And I, I, I remember I used to be sort of a little bit embarrassed in a sense because whenever I would see what my colleagues were going through in other countries, um, which didn't have the First Amendment to protect them, I always had to say, well, you know, you know, yes, we are editorial cartoons, we have to deal with things in America, but we don't have to worry about it because we have the First Amendment. The thing that has changed that I feel, and I, and I don't mean that there's anything concrete that's happened yet against a cartoonist, but, you know, once the election occurred and Trump won, and even before that when he was talking about the press, you know, if you're following anything that Trump is saying, um, he's, he's basically kind of not, he's not dismissing us, but he's, he's changing our role. He's making it appear as though we're supposed to be there, his personal PR firm. He doesn't see a free press as being essential to a democracy. So this is the reason that I feel that we should be very aware, especially as cartoonists, because the thing that cartoonists have to deal with that's different than other journalists is that we deal in images. And images will cross over anywhere. And now that we have the internet and people can share things so easily, you know, as we see that things spread, especially during the Danish cartoon controversy in 2006, where people could see those cartoons like within hours, we are the ones that are on the front lines. So I'm just, I'm just putting up a warning, you know, siren to people saying that you need to understand that if we have an administration right now that has absolutely no respect for a free press, that we are going to be the first people that are going to actually feel it. So that was what I wanted to say in that in that speech. Now, in, in your your AAC role, just you know, getting around and talking to your fellow cartoonists, is that a widely expressed concern? Do you feel like people haven't really grasped the immediacy of the danger? How do you feel like your peers? The cartoonists, you mean? Yeah, your cartooning peers. Are they on board with, or do they think, oh, oh, come on, you what know, it's always. <laughs> <laughs> well, be, I, I do think we're aware of it because we obviously follow what, you know, the president is saying. So I do think we are aware of it. Like I said, nothing concrete's happened yet. I mean, the only thing that's been said is, is you know, he, you know, he wants to libel laws. He wants to return libel laws. <laughs> he wants to return laws, libel yeah. laws, which is interesting because we're actually coming up against the 30th anniversary of the Hustler v. Falwell decision. And if you don't know what that is, I recommend you read about it because that is, that was, that was our that was our pivotal point right there, is that was a very important case for us. Even though it wasn't about editorial cartoons, it was about satire. And the Supreme Court upheld our right to deal in satire. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's something that I think that we have to be very well aware of. Okay. You know, there was a, there was a cartoon on here that I will inevitably not be able to find. But you, you gave me a couple of series cartoons about the issue where you did larger, almost like kind of informational cartoons on that matter. And you, you know, one thing that's really great about Anne's, and especially your recent career, is kind of your embrace of all different models of cartooning and trying to figure out some match to technology and some kind of, not just panel cartoons. So right. this is kind of one of your, uh, one that kind of appears in a big way that you've broken down into panels. It's, but, the, it's like a visual essay thing that many of you obviously do in your work. So where, where, who gets to read this visual essay? Who was this? This is on the Washington Post. Okay. I have a blog. So I can, what's nice about that is I can do anything. I can do animation. I can do visual <laughs> essays because it scrolls down. Very natural for it. And I can do a traditional box editorial cartoon. And I write occasionally. <laughs> I, <laughs> I happened to be in a bar the night before. And I just thought, <laughs> I thought, this is great. This is a great idea. <laughs> And then there's um, a second one that's kind of... Uh, this is specifically about what we are just talking about. Yeah. <laughs> These are wonderfully designed. I like the... <laughs> but, you, I mean, you know, I know this is, it's, it's funny, you know, to talk about his golf carts and everything, but, you know, think about it. He's restricting what you're seeing, you know, what the president is actually doing. The administration is trying to control that. I mean, the whole thing about the White House press briefings, I know that we all laugh at that. And as cartoonists, I know that we have all done cartoons against this. They're sort of pointless because it's a lot about being in front of television and journalists stand up and they say, they ask stupid questions. But he's now restricting that. You're not even seeing that. And you should be concerned that the White House is doing this. 
Matt, you sent me an impressive number of cartoons on the same subject as well. And I wondered if... Wait, the number ooh, was impressive? The number was impressive. <laughs> the cartoons... <laughs> okay. Let me get, let me get out of... It's going to be like that, is it? Okay. No, no. We're, let me... But, I, you know, and I wondered... First of all, if you kind of have felt the same thing. I mean, you have a parallel career. I mean, do you kind of feel the same encroaching kind of perhaps um, horror or, or difficulties that might lie ahead? And also, I wonder if you know, doing cartoons on this, maybe some people say, um, enough with the self-reflection. Like, I don't, I, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, why are you talking about journalism subjects mm -hmm. instead of talking about the matters more directly? What, what do you feel, is that a danger? And do you feel like that's, um, that's uh, um, do you get that pushback? Um, you get more and more pushback. I mean, I've been doing this, I've been doing cartoon, political cartoons for 40 years. And I am actually really fascinated by the evolution of the media. It, the news media has changed immensely in the 40 years I've been um, playing in the sort of sandbox corner of it. And, um, you know, once upon a time, 40 years ago, if somebody didn't like a cartoon, they had to like write a note and then get a first class stamp and mail it to the editor. And three days later, um, the, those few people that wanted to spend the money on the stamp would get to register their, their, their complaint. And now you have comment sections and Twitter and Facebook, and there's immediate feedback. It doesn't cost you 47 cents to respond to the cartoon. And um, th there's, I mean, Ben and I were talking earlier about this. There's sort of, there's, it's surprising at, at a place like SPX to stop and realize a lot of people in the world don't like cartoons. And they don't get cartoons, and they misconstrue them. And, um, and so, you know, if you're like Musa Kart in Turkey, and the government doesn't like or get your cartoon, uh, they throw you in jail. And um, I think Donald Trump would love to be able to sue cartoonists here, like Ann was talking about. But fortunately, because of the Supreme Court decision, he can't. That he'll try. Not yet. <laughs> and he may try. He may try. I mean, it was, you know, one, one decision by the Rehnquist Court 30 years ago that that said, no, you can't, you're allowed to make fun of public figures, and those people can't sue you for emotional harm or emotional whatever. Emotional distress. Right. <laughs> but, then, but then there's this whole other thing that happens where if you do a cartoon that people don't get or uh, object to, um, they, they go on a, on a social media attack. And, um, and Anne's had this experience in spades, and I just got a, a, that treatment recently. Yeah, well, I want to ask you about that. I'm going to pop that, that cartoon. And I wondered about maybe, and maybe Anne or any of the other panelists kind of feel that this was, is this how we will experience the pushback? Talk about, when did you know that people were objecting to the cartoon? Like, how, what was your first, this was a hurricane? It was about, it was about the Texas hurricane. It was actually, if, if, if you can't read it, it's uh, a guy's being rescued from a, a Texas secessionist um, clubhouse, and he's saying, Angel sent by God, and the guy on the rooftop saying, Er, actually, Coast Guard sent by the U.S. government. And, I mean, it's not that great a cartoon. I mean, there were, <laughs> <laughs> there were, there were you know, maybe half a dozen variations on the same idea. Usually when there's a natural disaster, you'll go back and people will make fun of libertarians who hate the government taking government aid. It's, it's a basic, simple political irony. But for some reason, um, it, it gets out there in the social media, and uh, Michelle Malkin and some of the conservative bloggers decided that they were going to twist it and say, look at that horrible Politico cartoonist. He's making fun of all Texans. He thinks we're a bunch of rubes who wear Confederate flags, and which is not what the cartoon's saying. I mean, it's like if I did a cartoon about Charlottesville and was making fun of Nazis in Charlottesville. It's not about all Virginians, right? I mean, most you, you guys get that. But there's an amazing number of people out there who are easily caught up in this kind of maelstrom. And then it jumps from social media to conventional media, and Fox Television starts running with it. And it's, it's frankly, again, it's not that good a cartoon. The main reason that I got caught up in it is that, the, that Politico has a lot of enemies in the media landscape, and they could use me as a stick to beat Politico with, mm -hmm. including the Washington Post. Sure. Yes, they did. Yeah, they, they did. did an so, awful job. <laughs> but, and some of it's just that petty. But, but it's, unfortunately, my editors were great, and they stood behind me, and um, my job was never threatened. But that's the point. It's a form of intimidation where people, they want to scalp, and, they, 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 and the best way they can do that is start one of these big firestorms. Now, do you think, I mean, the culture of newspapers is such that there's a different, I think, um, or in online magazines, that there's a different 
a way they look at free speech, which, you know, we just, the the, the, the sportscaster, Jamel Hill, just yeah. went to a thing where she was pressured uh, immensely and nearly moved off the air without some internal kind of support for her at the company with her fellow broadcasters. And I wonder, is that the model? Does that, is that the model? Is it, is it kind of like engineering social media against a specific cartoonist as having gone too far yeah. and then boycotting or threatening, you know, by all decent and then kind of making an appeal to commercial? Yeah. Circumstances? Is right, that what it right. looks like? You don't, you don't have to, like, uh, throw the, the cartoonist in jail, but you can get them fired and ruin their career. Mm -hmm. And right. that's definitely the target. And it's interesting. I mean, people should think about this. This thing with the ESPN anchor who called uh, Trump a white supremacist. I mean, think about what kind of banana republic politics this is where the, the White House calls f that for somebody to be fired for criticizing the president. Yeah. I mean, think about it. It's just for I mean, criticizing. It's a form of authoritarian yeah. sort of stuff where it's like, you know, A, grow a spine. Or, I mean, it just, the right's always complaining about snowflakes. And it's like a sportscaster called you a name, and you're going to go on a jihad and, and insist that she get fired. <laughs> it's, it's like a lot of things with Trump. We've never seen that before. Do any of you detect, detect a cartoonist, other cartoonists in, internalizing this? Because I know, no matter like the outcome was a good outcome in terms of your support from your employer, mm -hmm. but that can't have been like your favorite few days of the last ten <laughs> years. That must have been rough. And I know that there are people that you know in their jobs like I don't want. Has anyone communicated like I? I'm glad that you know that you were out there doing it, but man, I'm not. I don't want to deal with this kind of crap. Are people energized? Is the I are the cartoonists you know? Well, we're pretty. Do you feel free well, to? No, we we. Editorial cartoons, we're used to it because okay. we started obviously, you know, back in the days with just letters to the editor, and then we had email, and then we went over to social media. It's it is very intense, and and you're right, but it's something new that we're dealing with. I mean, mm -hmm. it's 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 pretty new. Um, it really helps when your employer backs you up. Mm -hmm. That is the big thing, and we also have an association, um, the AAEC, which I'm the president of. That you know. They backed me up when I had my social media thing going on. Um, and that makes a big difference. And your, your colleagues will also back you up. So that, that is a big thing. And you have to realize that these social media attacks, they are orchestrated. Um, it's, right. it's not just some guy coming out of the woodwork saying, you're an idiot. It's, it's you know, with you, Michelle Malkin, she did the same thing to me. No, and she came no. after me. I mean, you have to realize where it's coming from as well. And, well, and this is an odd sort of aside, but the other thing that's strange in the media landscape is once upon a time, if you were a newspaper and you were based on selling people subscriptions, they hated this kind of controversy because the way people punish them is they cancel a subscription. Yeah, um, huh. In sort of the inter internet news media landscape, people create provocative stuff because it energizes their base. I mean, Breitbart, Michelle Malkin, and a lot of the conservative bloggers, the, 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 the thing that sustains them is, cr is creating these firestorms and everybody gets fired up and goes to their, their websites. And so there's a certain, even with cartoonists, I think, you, there's a weird perverse incentive to go out there and poke somebody in the eye and hope you start one of these things, and it's a way of getting attention, too. Sure. It, feed, it, it's, it fuels this whole thing, and it becomes kind of a strange, vicious cycle. And uh, I, I, you have to watch out for that from the other side, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, Matt, I think of you and I think of Politico, and I think of Anne, I think of The Post. Um, like Keith, you're Keith, right? I mean, you're an individual person, you have a range of comics that you do, and some of them are political. Is the pressure different on you? Is the reaction different? Do people say, I like this stuff you do, but not that other stuff, that um, political stuff? What is it like for you to kind of operate, whoa? It's, it's interesting because, um, yeah, like, I don't really have anybody to back me up. <laughs> but it, it's also interesting that, um, you know, uh, I don't, I, my first online attack from uh, white supremacists really came just earlier this year for the first time, at, like, in my 25-year career. I, feel, I felt like I... I I hit another level once. Uh, <laughs> what took you so long? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, all of a sudden, I, I opened my Twitter, and there were, like, 20 messages. And clearly, it was orchestrated. And I was like, I, I tweeted, like, oh, my god. Like, um, someone said, 
you know, Keith, you've reached this level, like, it's time to block people. I had no idea that you could block people on Twitter. <laughs> I was like, wow, you can block people? So uh, uh, it, it was really kind of interesting, but um, I don't know. I just learned early on that, um, I learned early on through an experience uh, with uh, a small publisher of mine that it was important for me to retain as many of my rights as possible and really just sort of be this um, sort of freelance thing that, you know, I don't mind working with a big publisher, and, um, uh, or, but most of the time I'm going to work for myself and do my best to retain my, st uh, like, it's almost as if the econ this sort of DIY economy caught up to what I've been doing for 25 years, you know, and so uh, I am psyched to be sort of in the position that I'm, I'm, I'm at where um, I always tell people this, um, the shittiest stuff <laughs> is usually the easiest stuff to find. And so when, you, 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 when you're talking about pop music, um, you know, that's the easiest, you, you can hear all the newest, shittiest stuff all the time, even when you try to avoid it. And I always urge people, uh, like hip hop, like music, you have to sort of dig in the crates to find the good stuff. So, you know, every panelist up here is getting harder and harder to find because of, of the various, you know, the way the media is changing. So I, it's, it's important for you to, to look for us and, and find us and support what we do because it, we really are the first, that first line. And, and we are seeing shit that we've no, we haven't seen in this country in a really long time. Yeah. And, um, you know, in some ways, one of my books is called Too Small to Fail. You know, I think, <laughs> I think I've been under the radar uh, forever. <laughs> and I kind of like just being a little bit under the radar. Uh, so it, it really isn't uh, uh, that easy to find me, even the, even the folks who want to get me for the comics that I do. But um, I will say this, I, I, one of the biggest things now is getting uh, cancer hate mail. I don't know if you got, guys got that. Cancer hate mail? Yeah. People, wishing you People are wishing you cancer. That's like a... That's yeah. <laughs> and your family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, um, I didn't draw the cancer hate mail that I got, but, uh, but someone else got a cancer email and sent to them, and I did a comic out of it, and it's, it's like... You know, the person writes, you know, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I will say it right now. I hope you get cancer. And then, and then it starts ranting about, you know. Then list the kinds of cancer they want you to get. Body parts? <laughs> well, at the end, he wished the cartoonist uh, a Merry Christmas. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it, it is a, an, an extremely weird time. But really, but also it's a time where, like, I... I'm excited to see a lot of younger people getting involved politically, like in and 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 doing editorial cartoonists in their own way, like not maybe not traditionally like you'd see in the newspaper, but doing these zines. Like I'm seeing political zines and stuff that I, you know, I used to be like, the, you know, the weird political co the guy doing race in the corner, you know, and and now I'm starting to see it all over the place, which is really really uh, exciting. And that is, that is a, a follow up question I wanted to ask because you talked about people catching up to you, and I know with some journalists that have covered issues that are now prominent, that there is um, kind of a, a, some of them have written cheekily, kind of, of a, you know, that other mainstream reporting organizations have kind of all of a sudden become interested in the age of Trump and issues that they used to ignore. I mean, do you feel like, I mean, you, you seem like you feel you were welcome for like the, the other cartoonists to kind of deal in topics that you've been dealing with maybe more frequently than that you've been dealing with in, you know, several, several years throughout your entire career? Well, definitely the police brutality cartoons. I've been doing police brutality cartoons for 25 years and, and just to see it sort of, once everybody got cell phones and social media, you know, blew it wide open. I, I, believe me, I, I was, psyched that it sort of went from me trying to convince people that this stuff happened to like clearly like you can't you can't ignore it now um, you know the first thing that we gotta the first thing for this country to ever move forward is to acknowledge that 
you know, this country was built on ex exploitation of, of people that look like me. And, and once we, because we don't teach it in school, certainly not. Uh, Lincoln freed the slaves. There was Martin Luther King. And now you have a black president. So uh, everything's wonderful. <laughs> but once you just acknowledge that, like, and, and start to understand that there's an explanation for all everything for for police, you know, nickeling and diming poor black communities and brown communities, and and you know, exploitation of, of immigrants and pitting poor whites, you know, rich getting poor whites to to be to blame people of color for taking their jobs and doing all this stuff. If you know that historically, then everything's explained, and and and. Then you sit there and start, okay, how can we make this different? And uh, so I, you know, every, a lot of people are always going to be, uh, like mainstream media is always going to be slow to it. You know, they have to figure out how they can make money from it or get ratings from it. But I welcome that attention, you know. Mm. I welcome that attention because that's the only way we're going to move forward. The only way we'll move forward in a white supremacist society is for white people to get on board and be like, Whoa! This is effed up. Like we, it, and we have to change it. Neo Nazis are are not my community's problems. It's white people problems. You know, that's that's a white person problem. Then I want to I want to ask you about there was two specific comics that, that you did for the Nib, and one was about kind of the why that you went to an a anti-Klan protest in, in Stone Mountain, Georgia, actually, what's the Stone Mountain, Georgia? Yeah, in Stone Mountain, yeah. And, and the birthplace of the, of the modern Klan, and also the one that you did about the uh, taking down of statues in your beloved New Orleans, um, and, and uh, kind of right at the, that was a, this year, that was a spring cartoon this year. Yeah. And I wondered, if, do, is the feedback you get reminiscent, is there any pushback that you get reminiscent of the kind of direct kind of fire that guy um, kind of protest that you get from editorial cartoonist readers right. or, is it, or is it different? I mean I think it's like Keith like I like clearly the nib employs me but I feel like people I don't think people understand how I get my money or something like um, like the nib could fire me but I'm gonna be all right they're not you know <laughs> sure. <laughs> They're not keeping my lights on like that. Um, but I mean, honestly, I think because I'm not as an exciting target because I don't have a, a much longer career, um, people, yeah, people want to fling me a little bit. But it's, it's not really that, I mean, it's not really that hard for me, me to deal with. You know what I mean? I'm an ignorant person. Like, I'm going to just say whatever crazy stuff because, no, you know, I'm a freelance person. What's, no one's going to fire me, right? Um, That's the great thing, though, yeah. which is, I it's a, a exciting to have to know someone stewing, trying to figure out who they can complain to. And yeah. Can't, yeah, can't figure it out. Like, you can call my mom. Like, <laughs> um, but yeah, I I mean it's sort of I, not not to be an edge lord about it, but like when I do get when I do get angry emails, like it's like you're. I know, like, this is, like, the most they can do. Like, they can't figure out how to fire me. You know what I mean? They're, like, clearly, when it comes to, like, real vile racists, I feel like some of the anger is, like, is that I have a platform to say what I want. Um, and this is, like, the best they can match it is, like, fling me on their, like, bot account, you know? So it's, like, they're kind of showing their ass a little bit. You know what I mean? It's, like, this is the best you got, man. Like, I, I actually know. did have a Trump supporter call my mother. Right. <laughs> no, seriously, because I have the I have a last name that isn't common, and they found her on the phone book, and they called her up and they said, "Are you the, are you the mother of Ann Telmus?" And my my mother doesn't get these things, and she just kind of went, uh, "Yes, who is this?" <laughs> and thankfully, the guy wasn't rude, but he just said, "You know, you really ought to tell her she needs to do some of those cartoons about Hillary Clinton." <laughs> and my mother's like, "Who is this?" And then he hung up. <laughs> 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 You know, it happens. They'll find you. The, uh, another thing that, I guess something that, like, at least for perspective, is that, um, like, the most I do for Nib, like, all the Nib stories I do are, are about, like, street protests or, like, things like that. And, and they're things that I go to a lot, and, and, I, and I got arrested at one of them, the one about Stone Mountain. Oh, yeah, I'm in jail. 
Um, <laughs> and, the, and the police are super helpful, so they like put my name and my age and information out. They do that all the time. Uh, that's a thing. Um, so then Nazis were putting that around, and and, um, and so my life was threatened. Um, and they can come and try and find me. At the time, I was living in New Orleans in an all-black neighborhood, and we all have guns. Um, <laughs> so you can come find me. <laughs> um, but that's also been like, I don't know, that's like something I think about all the time that's been like sort of like helpful. It's like these cowards, like they won't find me. You know what I mean? They'll flame me, but... That's, they don't, they don't really have much. I don't know. Um, but something that, maybe this is jumping off topic, but I, I do think that like, something that worries me is that um, there, is, there is like a question that I do think like on, on the left broadly, I'm probably more like the alt left or something, um, as that we do have to like answer like the skepticism that people have towards like civil society that I think is real. Um, like Trump is a terrible person and he's like definitely like but he's like pushing buttons like it's interesting for him to bring up skepticism towards the press because that was a crazy that was a left thing right mm -hmm. we were talking about like the corporate media for a long time um, so it, it's just sort of interesting it's like sometimes I worry that like we focus too much on like the way Trump is you know what I mean and not and I don't know and not talk about like like how we address the problems that are happening in the white community. You know what I mean? It's like, I hate Nazis. I feel like the best thing to do is to have a, a polite conversation. Um, I mean, hit them. But it is, it is true that it, it is responding. And it, you know, they, they, a lot of them are coming from a place of disenfranchisement and alienation, which is real. Like we do live in, a, I think, an inherently alienating society in these particular ways. Like poverty is a thing. Um, so anyway, that's a tangent. You know, your approach to your comics, and, and because they are um, um, long-form comics, I think you have more room to do this. Can everyone hear me? I think I'm not getting the feedback from the microphone, but I, I'm a big, fat guy with a loud voice. Okay, cool. Um, and so you have a, you know, there's humor in your comics. There, you place yourself in some of your comics as a narrator. You explain a lot of things concisely and bring forth a lot of issues. It's, so it's very, it's a very considered approach. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, for the panel in general, is there anything about the way that we approach the art of it, the making of the cartoons, that is appropriate to the times? Um, that if it, we are going to be kind of more you're going to be more directly pushed back against. If some weirdo is going to call your mom, um, <laughs> if Trump tries to get it so that he can sue people in the Erdogan way, what is it? That, how can you respond as artists? What is the? Is there anything that you can think of that's appropriate to the time? Is it just keep engaging these subjects fearlessly? Is it explain through cartoons kind of why these issues are important? How do you feel about your response as artists to this specific issue of pressure? I mean, for me, I think the reason, I think my goal, specifically with my comics, like I'm not, like I'm not really a journalist. Um, no one's going to accuse me of that. But I, I think that, for me, I want people to leave their house. Like something I hear, particularly from like, I mean, both black and white people, um, but from like a lot of, a lot of, I think the combination of me making your black friend, which, you know, um, a lot of people felt some type of way, just you know, sort of positive, but I think like non-constructive, where they're like, I feel helpless in the face of white supremacy, but want to be a good white ally. And I think with Trump, people are like, wow, this is unthinkable and crazy. I didn't think that. But other people thought it was unthinkable and crazy and didn't know what the next steps were. And for me, it's like, get out of the house. You know what I mean? There's like, um, there's very real struggles, you know what I mean, going on. Um, and for me, it's like, I don't know, like, it's not enough to read and like things. Um, it's not enough to like, like, there's a, there's like peak information. It's like, you can know all about like the American guard, but at some point you're going to have to go outside and face them. Um, and for me, it, I, I hope through my work, that's ultimately the response is like, how do you engage your life and be a part of struggle for liberation, positivity, anti-racism? I totally lied to everybody and left you with almost no time to ask questions. We have about 10 minutes. Um, I'll do it again, too. Um, uh, do we have uh, the microphones on the side. If anyone has a question, they'd like to ask these four wonderfully articulate and smart and formidable cartoonists. Is there a question? No, there's people going. 
Oh, you, if you can go really loud, that would be great. Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. When you go to foreign countries, let's say Europe, you find cartoons that are very provocative, like Sarkozy mounting a sheep or something like that. Sure. The Charlie Hebdo cartoon. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it, you, the Hebdo did a cartoon almost like Matt's cartoon, except they put them underwater uh, doing a Nazi salute. So there is a, a more severe degree of, of invective, <laughs> sure. But is there a cultural differences, and are there red lines that you guys will not cross? Um, I think, I mean, the thing that's interesting to me, again, to be feeling like an old dog who's been in, in this barnyard for a while, the thing that's changed is once upon a time, if you did a, a provocative cartoon for a Parisian audience in Charlie Hebdo, it stayed in Paris. I mean, and, and we now live in a, in a, or if I did a provocative cartoon, heartlessly making fun of Texans drowning in floods, um, but I was only doing it for people in Washington, D.C., it wouldn't have the same uh, problems. And we live in a, a world now where if, if Charlie Hebdo does something, does something, it appears everywhere around the world at the same time it appears in Paris. And people are entitled to have different senses of humor. And some people go really black, and some people go fairly heartless, and some people go very light. And uh, it's a small world after all, to quote Walt Disney, and everybody's got a different sense of humor. And we haven't figured out how to manage that yet. I, I think you're right, though, about the definitely what I've noticed from overseas, especially in the British press, the editorial cartoonists Ooh. are brutal there. I yeah. think their work is wonderful. I do think it's changing, though, and I'll give you a personal example. I mean, you know, I have editors at Post, and I remember when, even during, leading up to the election, you know, the whole talk about using the word lie. Remember that? That people, like NPR wouldn't yeah. say that Trump lied yeah, yeah. about things. The Post was the same way. They would not. I remember I even sent in a file that had lie in the file, and my editor said, don't put that in there. I'm like, what? So then, just recently, I could say lie. They are allowing me now to use the word lie when I'm doing a Trump cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, that's changed because we're in new territory. So I do think that the editorial cartoons are now, we have a little bit more to work with because of the political situation we're in. We haven't had this situation before. This is very different than, you know, Matt's been in it for a long time, I've been in it for a long time. This is definitely different than what we've seen before. Do we have a question maybe over on the side? Hi, um, I was curious to see if any of you guys, if you had started out during this presidential election depicting Trump in a certain way, and then as it became clear that he wasn't just a kind of one-off joke, if you sort of changed how you drew him or depicted him, or do you have any sort of thoughts on how you choose or don't choose to depict him? I think there's always a, a sort of time where you have to get used to you know, you got to figure out how you're going to draw him. <clears throat> and so, you know, um, I, I actually stopped. <laughs> I was drawing him before the election, but I think after the election, I didn't. I haven't done as many Trump cartoons as as a, a, a lot of people have done because I think a lot of the um, he he's very good at taking attention away from other issues, and so uh, I, I've found that um, when I focus on the police brutality stuff or a lot of the race stuff that's happening outside of, of him, um, you know, I, it's, I get more attention being the cartoonist who's not drawing Trump all the time. But, uh, but then, I've, you know, I've, I've done some really sleazeball Trump stuff too, certainly so. Uh, my last Cantor email was uh, a Sunday strip I did for my uh, daily, daily um, nightlife cartoon, which I generally, I mix in politics indirectly, but this is the first time. I have this thing on, in my Sunday strip about the, um, it's a parody of the most interesting room in the world, but uh, it's called the creepiest guy in the world. And it used to be this, this older guy with uh, this sort of, guy who would wear pajamas and slippers and, and wear a long ponytail. But um, I did that for years, but I've changed it to Trump and just, you know, had him talking about his daughter and stuff like that. And I mean, clearly, he is the creepiest guy in the world, like right now. 
And uh, <laughs> and so when I did that, like, I, yeah, the the last the email that the guy sent was just he was very proud of himself for for sending this uh, email, hoping that I would die or something like that. But uh, but again, like they don't know they don't know who to get to fire me. So it's I will continue to do that. Can we go across the room? Did you have a question? You just I do, yeah. yeah. Um, I was wondering if any of you could compare uh, in the cartooning world the difference between the Nixon moment in cartooning and the Trump moment. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, look at the old guy. <laughs> 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 no, I was. I, I was. I was. I was. I was in uh, high school during Watergate. I was drawing for the uh, Palace Springs High Trident. During Watergate. <laughs> uh, yeah, you have to start somewhere. Um, the, uh, you know, it's interesting. I think that uh, in some ways, if you go back and you look at the stuff that that was being published in the mainstream media about Richard Nixon, the kind of cartoons I think of David Levine stuff and stuff that Oliphant and Conrad were drawing. Um, it was really harsh stuff, mm -hmm. and I think that in some ways, um, I'm all in favor of, of pol political correctness in the positive sense, but in a certain sense, it's, it's put a certain pressure on cartoonists and editors who publish cartoons, and the this, this stuff drawn in the early 70s about Nixon was edgier and rougher and much more sort of, like Anne was saying, the English cartoonists can get away with murder. They love just drawing shit, literally shit in their cartoons. <laughs> and the mainstream dailies here would never print it. But back in the 70s, there was a period of time when I think um, American political satire was much edgier in, in sort of the mainstream places. It's hard to imagine the, the Levine, the Kissinger cartoon, yeah. where it's Kissinger you know, sexually assaulting the, the earth, the, the world, earth, the world. Yeah, you would on yeah. the world. It's this really nasty, spiteful, yeah. you know, upsetting image. Um, and it, uh, that was in the New York Review of Books, probably? I think it was in the New York Times. New York right? Times, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, so it's hard to imagine that happening. No, and today. you go back and you look at, like, the op-ed pages in, during that period of time, and the op-ed art that people were doing was really out there. It was great. It was much stronger. Editors were much sort of bolder and felt freer. And now a lot of op-ed pages around the, the um, country rely on photographs. They don't use edgy political satire. Do, do, is, is there anyone that you would point out to the audience that's doing particularly good work, like in that sense, kind of this going full bore at Trump in that kind of classic Oliphant? Uh -huh. Mr. Fish. Oh, yeah. 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 Mr. Fish, Dwayne uh, Booth. Yes. Yeah, he's yeah. great. He's, he does a lot of stuff for Truth Dig. Look at his stuff. It's, it's wonderful. And, and actually, I mean, this is, this is sort of surprising, but The New Yorker, I think, in the last couple of years has gotten much more edgy and political with, like, particularly their cover art, uh, some of the wonderful stuff that Barry Blitt has done. Um, it's just extraordinary. You know, and The New Yorker used to do sort of staid watercolors of the house in Cape Cod, and then now instead they just, uh, they've had some, some of the best visual political commentary you'll find in The, in the New Yorker. I would, I would urge you to follow all of the cartoonists that, that, that are speaking here today. I, as far as the weekend itself, I'm guessing that, are you guys not, you're not anywhere specific or at a table at all, but you are around we for the rest hurt. of the weekend, and, mm -hmm. and hopefully you'll catch up and, and grab an elbow and, 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 and uh, share with them if there's anything on your mind. I'm sure they'd welcome that. I, I just offered that up. Without, <laughs> but I, I hope that if you find them, then and, and, uh, and, 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 and we'll talk to them. They're here for the weekend. And you guys are, I imagine, tabling. Yeah. Um, ben, where are you so that people can come find you? I'm at a J1 with the Silver Sprocket table. And Keith? Um, I think I'm at w, W50. And I have a special guest at my table, uh, Steve Notley, uh, Bob the Angry Flower who usually tables next to me with a flower hat at uh, San Diego Comic-Con, so. He is a festival legend. Yes, yes, so uh, he, I wasn't there for his 50th, uh, 50th, 25th anniversary of Bond the Angry Flower, so he's here as a special guest at my table. And um, I do have uh, Trump Yes We Clan uh, bumper stickers. <laughs> I urge you not to put them on your car, but uh, <laughs> they're good to send the family for <laughs> Um, help me thank our, our wonderful panel.